Why are you concerned about GMOs and the mainstream media, including the New York Times, doesn't seem to think it's a problem? The four areas that Monsanto's PR um, focus on, media, government, farmers, academia. The media has been misreporting, have been missing the details. Um, a lot of people that do report accurately are attacked by Monsanto. They have a very sophisticated way of rating uh, reporters, of rewarding those that work with them. They'll fly reporters in from other countries. They work with the State Department so that the State Department recommends that reporters from other countries come and be wine and dine by Monsanto. They get to visit the uh, St. Louis facilities, etc. Um, and they're also in charge of a narrative that gets sent out through their front groups and their reporters and their pseudoscientists. Um, and they also can withhold money, research money or, or donations. And so they have a lot of leverage on, on academic institutions. We've seen this. It's not just, we're not just making this up. We know exactly this is what they've done. They threatened to hold back money. They threatened positions. They're very forceful. They have a, a line item called let nothing go. If anyone mentions anything about GMOs, if, certainly if there's, a, if there's a scientist that comes out against GMOs, they're attacked. So they also will create rigged research that the, the normal press won't pick up on. They'll just look at the conclusions and they'll hear the credentialed scientists say this is solid. And the thing is at the same time they say it's solid, they'll say those who are against it are anti-science. In other words, those of us who are calling for more science were anti-science. So the mainstream media has been doing a rather poor job. And we sometimes get in there. I've been on Dr. Oz a couple of times. I've been on the doctors a couple of times. But mostly, we get the information out through more specialized channels, online, social media now a lot. And now the online bosses, the Google searches, the Facebooks, um, YouTube, they're actually becoming extremely biased. And they're eliminating accounts altogether. They're redirecting search engine, search searches, so that you're, you don't end up getting the truth. You get what their sponsors want or what they want, etc. So it used to be that the internet was our, our trusted alternative. Now we have to be careful about which search engine we use and how we, how we get the information out in order to, to make sure that the truth gets out to the people that need to hear it. Um, but the mainstream media coverage in Europe about a high-profile food safety scandal related to GMOs in 1999 with Dr. Arpad Pustai caused the tipping point of consumer rejection in Europe. And it was described as one of the 10 most underreported events of the year in the US by Project Censored. And you could tell that the biotech industry did a full court press on the press so that they would not report like Europe did because Europe rejected GMOs because of the coverage. And it wasn't the European Commission or the European Food Safety Authority who are both pro-GMO. It was the people that, got, that said they don't want it. And it was Nestle's and Unilever and McDonald's and Burger King and others who responded to the people who responded to the press. So that's one reason why locking down the mainstream media was a priority for years by the biotech industry. Why do you think there's a correlation between the growth of GMOs and different diseases? Haven't a lot of things changed in the last 20 years, and therefore a lot of things would correlate with the increase in all these human diseases? What's interesting is that when people get rid of GMOs in their diet, or specifically if they switch to organic, so they're getting rid of GMOs and Roundup, because Roundup is sprayed on a lot of non-GMO crops, they report getting better from a variety of diseases. And I've asked 150 lectures, including a couple of dozen of them at medical conferences, and the doctors were reporting on behalf of thousands of people, and it was consistent. Digestive was number one, uh, brain fog and fatigue was number two, and there was weight problems and mood issues and skin conditions and all sorts of things. So we surveyed 3,256 people, and they, got re they reported getting better from the same 28 conditions that we heard in these lectures. And we talked to veterinarians who reported the animals getting better from these same conditions, both livestock and pets. So we actually have evidence of changing health issues when people switch from GMO and Roundup-laden food 
to non-GMO, non-Roundup. But we also have the animal feeding studies where the animals who are force-fed these products have the same conditions or their precursors in just 90 days. And you can see from the precursors, you could predict from those these particular set of diseases. So you have su substantial anecdotal evidence and case studies from doctors. You have cause plausible causative pathways. And you have also the epidemiological evidence with more than 30 diseases rising in parallel with the increased use of GMOs in Roundup. Then if you look at what is the mode of action of GMOs, Bt toxin, and Roundup, you can also predict these things. When you put all these together, the case is pretty strong. What kind of modes of, of action? Let's talk about just Roundup for a second because more research has been done on Roundup than on GMOs or the Bt toxin that's produced in some GMOs. So just look at Roundup. It damages the foundation of health, the ability to absorb minerals, the gut microbiome. It can create leaky gut. It can create birth defects. It can kill, da damage the mitochondria. It can cause the deficiency of neurotransmitters like serotonin, dopamine, and melatonin. It can cause uh, hormonal imbalance. It can cause suppressed digestive enzymes. So these are, these are fundamental. In the ability for cells to communicate with themselves, the ability of the, of the liver to detox, the ability of our cells to detox. It can create leaky brain. All of these have been documented, okay, whether it's in a test tube or in a human or in an animal, suggesting that they're going on in the entire population. If you look at just one of these things, just one, the gut bacteria, and you look at the changes that Roundup can do to the gut bacteria. I've asked an expert at gut bacteria. I listed the 28 different conditions that people got better from. And he said every single one of them could be predicted as a result of just changing the gut bacteria. We talk about leaky gut. That could be predictive of cancer, heart disease, uh, Parkinson's, Alzheimer's, uh, autoimmune disease, um, food sensitivities, and allergies. You talk about the mitochondrial damage that can be predictive of brain fog, fatigue, potential cancer, and, and, and accelerated aging. Each one of these can be predictive of these particular diseases. You put them all together, and it's a devastating case against Roundup alone. It also damages, I didn't even mention that it damages the DNA and could lead to cancer. So we understand now with the personal experience, the animal experience, the animal feeding studies, the epidemiological evidence, the modes of action, we have a tight case as to why it is likely, it is likely the most serious impactful thing in terms of negative health that we're facing today. GMOs and Roundup, we'll put them together.